All right, so people are joining now. Peggy, you want to kick us off? Okay, sounds good. I've got 12 o'clock and uh, let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone to our webinar where you will hear from an experienced professional today, Paul Overton. Uh, he's going to explain the process of the uh, law and how the law applies. I'm Peggy West, I'm your organizer, and um, I did a little bit of research, and the 558 claim is a pre-suit notice and the right to cure procedure in Florida. So Paul's going to tell us all details. It's also known as the Florida Construction Defect Statute. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce our sponsors for today, and uh, these are the people who invited you, so I say thank you and also hope that you will patronize them when you can. Uh, I'm gonna start off with the Wind Beneath My Wings, Ventium software. Uh, Ventium is uh, providing websites for condominiums. And today we have also the director for marketing as well as customer success, Layla Scola. Uh, Layla, tell us a little bit about yourself and the company. Thank you, Peggy. As Peggy said, my name's Layla. I'm head of marketing customer success here at Vintium. Vintium is a software company. We've been in the market for 10 years now, and we have two different softwares. Our main one is Neighbors by Vintium, which provides you with websites and a secure portal to communicate mm -hmm. with residents and manage your HOA. And the second is Inspections by Vintium to help you with all your inspection needs. Thanks so much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate all you do for the webinars. This is our IT support. She also has an assistant, Yasmin Johannes, I want to mention, and please tell her thank you also. Uh, next, I want to introduce your host is M2E Engineering. We have Rudy Martin on today. He is the Director of Strategic Business Development and also today's moderator. Uh, Rudy, please tell us about yourself and also the company. Thank you, Peggy. So M2E is a full service engineering firm. We specialize in everything from the building's inception, uh, the 558 turnover process, uh, the milestones and some of the structural review. We also have a full staff of mechanical, electrical and plumbing on staff. So anything your building needs, we are engineers and we love to solve problems. Uh, you will get my contact information uh, at the end of this. I'm also moderating this event. Uh, Paul's going to give us an amazing presentation. I'm going to politely interrupt him as we go on. There's a Q&A in the bottom. If you have any questions, hit the Q&A button. I'll keep, I'll keep an eye on this and I'll ask those questions. If you have something nice to say, you can go ahead and use the chat. Uh, no need to give your CAM numbers. We already have all those. Sometimes people flood us with that. We don't need that. So um, if you have any questions, the Q&A button, if you just want to leave a nice comment, that's what the chat button's for. And um, we've done a lot of these presentations and we're excited to have such a prestigious panel. So uh, Peggy, thank you. And um, I'm excited about this one. Yes, I also want to take a minute and thank Autumn. Autumn O'Brien's on from M2E Engineering. She's the marketing manager and business development uh, coordinator. <laughs> and I see a, a cheerleader there. Autumn, tell us about yourself. Um, so I do a lot of the new business development in the Orlando, the central Florida region over to the Space Coast and up into Jacksonville. Um, so if you're out and about and you see me at an event, come up and tell me that you were uh, a participant in our webinar. Awesome. Awesome. Great job today. Also. Okay. Next, we're going to introduce uh, Valley Insurance. Uh, we have the Commercial Insurance Advisor and the Association Specialist on, Tyler Spett. Tyler, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing awesome today. This is Tyler Spate with Valley Insurance, mm -hmm. Association and Property Expert. Um, great team that we have on this call. I've had the pleasure with working with some of these gentlemen and ladies before, and I'm excited for this event, and I'm very happy that we have this exact group on this call. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for your efforts in inviting people. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Patrick Howell. He's an attorney with Becker and Polikoff. Patrick, tell us about yourself and what you guys specialize in for associations. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I am a lawyer and Becker and Polikoff is a full service law firm. 
Uh, we have a very large construction defect department um, and practice group. Um, and I am one of those lawyers. I'm board certified. Uh, we handle cases on an hourly contingency basis, depending on the needs of our clients. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's what I do. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You have an outstanding reputation. So if you need a good attorney, call Patrick, right? Okay, next I want to introduce the ACAM Property Management Services Company. Uh, we have on today, we have David Ward. He's a business development manager. Uh, David, tell us about yourself and the company. Uh, thank you, Peggy. Thank you everyone for joining us today and to the, for, I think a very important discussion uh, for 558 process and the intricacies that can be rather complicated. Uh, ACAM is a company that's been founded since 1903, so in business for the last 40 years. We have a presence in South Florida for the last 15 years with a focus on luxury condominiums and HOAs, and we take pride in by hospitality, residential hospitality service in our training. So please, at the end, I'll be sharing our email address. Is there anything I can do personally for board members, CAM managers, uh, beyond the experts, of course, today from the management side, I'm happy to help. Great. Thank you so much and welcome. Now, is Giselle going to be on? We'll mention uh, Giselle Sagi. She is also uh, the marketing uh, director and helps with business development at ACAM. So please thank her for her involvement and her invitations and time. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, now it's time to introduce our speaker today, Paul Overton. Uh, Paul is the CEO for Overton Construction and Consulting. Uh, he is the founder and has been in coatings and construction industry for over 20 years. Uh, he's been involved in new construction, construction defect, commercial, apartment, HOA, and condo projects. In the state of Florida, he has focused on construction defects related to repairs and restoration of older buildings stemming from the new legislation relating to the milestone inspections. Of course, if you have any questions, you can contact Paul about inspecting your building and uh, handling repairs. Overton Construction and Consulting specializes in construction defect cases expert work, restoration, and construction projects stemming from milestone for HOA, condo, commercial building owners, and multifamily managers. With that, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys yeah, today's thanks, presentation. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. I don't really have anything to add after that. You pretty much summed it up. I'd like to thank all the, the participants and the sponsors and everybody that joined us today. And without further ado, I will get in here. Let me know, can everybody see my screen? Yep, we see it. Perfect. Okay, so when we talk about the construction defect process or the 558 claim, and I know it's a small minutia, but if you're if you're north of Fort Lauderdale, they call it a construction defect claim. If you're south of Fort Lauderdale, they call it a 558 claim. They're, they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, technically, 558 process is a process within the construction defect, but either one works. We know what you're talking about. Um, but at, at any rate, we need to talk about normal maintenance um, versus defects. And I think most people, most managers, and most people understand Normal maintenance includes painting your buildings, doing the roof cleaning, power washing your buildings and walkways, cleaning the gutters, and just making sure there's general maintenance done on the community. Uh, when we talk about construction defects or building deficiencies, we're talking about delaminating stucco, leaking roofs and windows, uh, leaky decks, premature cracking of the asphalt and concrete. And we're gonna get into some more of the defects, but there's a big difference and one of the reasons it's important to understand this is once we file a claim or the attorneys file a claim, the defense is always going to argue that, that you didn't take care of your buildings, that you didn't have the maintenance done. So make sure that you're staying on top of it so they don't have an argument. So when we talk about construction defects, too, um, there's always a conversation about, you know, if we have a claim and it settles, who should we hire? 
And I know Patrick probably has some input on this, but the people that specialize in this provide expert witness services. Uh, they provide expert reports. They do cost estimation for mediation. They do destructive testing. They create scopes of work. Uh, they do the remediation and repairs. And typically, in 99% of the situations, they are also general contractors. And what should you look for in an attorney? And I'm going to let uh, Patrick handle this one since he's the expert in this field. What should we look for in an attorney, Patrick? Well, you know, with something as specialized as construction, uh, you'll want to look at board certification. It really is an easy way to sort of uh, winnow out uh, the, the lawyers that don't have the expertise um, in this area. The Florida Bar actually uh, only allows attorneys that are board certified uh, to call themselves experts in a particular field. Uh, less than 1% of all Florida attorneys are board certified. So uh, besides just uh, an extra exam that's required, there's also a, um, there's a number of years that you have to practice in that area of law. And then they also send out surveys to people that you've worked with and worked against, uh, including judges. So it's the vetting process is, is, uh, is pretty intense and uh, it, it really yields, uh, I think the best, the cream of the crop as far as uh, construction lawyers are concerned. I couldn't agree more. Any general counsel lawyer that's part of your HOA, uh, if he's worth his salt, he's going to make sure that you have a board certified lawyer like Patrick that deals with construction defects when you are when you have a new building. So not all lawyers are created equals. They don't always practice the same. So it's very important. To, and David uh, Ward from ACAM can um can comment on this as well, that it's very important that you get somebody that is board certified for your turnover process. So thank you. Yeah, I, I yeah. would just add uh, briefly that uh, from the management side, obviously boards, we, we work partnerships with managers, right? And so both the boards and the management company, we want to look as successful and as good as possible during a very complex situation and experience what we see at camp the best way to make sure that that occurs for both both sides of that partnership is to be really careful and vetting which attorney you want to select because they're the starting point of the entire process they're the experts that have all of the uh for almost like the going to the gym the amount of reps that they've seen compared to anyone else in this whole process so uh, this is just a really key area. And the more successful the attorney is, the more successful the board's going to look and the manager company is going to look. I will say this also, you know, one of the things that I, I love about being at Becker is we also have community association lawyers um, that work with us as well. Um, in fact, that's how Becker got started in 1972. And, you know, there are a lot of issues that that come up in the community association realm. Um, so it's always nice to be able to lean on those lawyers, ask them questions. You know, under Chapter 720, there's a required uh, vote of the owners. Um, under 718, you know, there's a warranty that's included in, uh, in the Condominium Act. Uh, we are constantly, as, as construction lawyers, going back and looking at Chapter 718 and chapter 720 um, in our cases. And so when I have questions, um, it's nice to be able to just go next door and ask Beth, Beth Patry or one of the community association lawyers that I work with uh, about, about these issues. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank all three of you. Um, from personal experience, I have been involved in hundreds of construction defect litigation um, cases. And I've seen some really, really good settlements from really good attorneys. And I've seen some really, really bad settlements from some really bad attorneys. So do your due diligence, um, you know, ask around, find out who's good, uh, what their track record is. And as Patrick mentioned, there's a lot of nuances in the construction defect process. There's timelines and, you know, there's notification and we're going to get into some of those. But if you don't have somebody that's experienced and has the reps, like David said, um, you may end up with nothing. And I've seen it happen. So do your due diligence. 
Okay, uh, Patrick, one of our favorite topics, the statute of ultimate repose and the statute of limitations. So as some of you may know, uh, the statute of ultimate repose was 10 years. We had 10 years to bring a construction defect claim. And uh, just last year, uh, it was moved to seven years, which I think is very bad for homeowners' uh, rights. I mean, I look at it as you, you saved up made the biggest investment of your life, and now you only have seven years to bring a claim um, if, there, if defects are found. And again, in future slides, you will see the defects and the types of defects, but some of these defects don't manifest themselves until year seven. So um, if they're behind the walls um, or in the rebar, you may not know about them. So um, anyways, in my opinion, not a good decision, and I know um, there's some interested parties kind of circling the wagons and trying to get those three years back. Um, but, you know, for now we're at seven. So I think, you know, if, if a development turns over, an internal clock should start ticking in your head saying, hey, I only have seven years max to file a claim. And then we have the four-year statute of limitations. And both these are completely different. And for... Uh, Verbatim, I don't know what the statute says. It says something about if you knew of or should have known about a construction defect and you did not bring a claim, then you could be barred from a recovery or filing a claim. And one of the examples I always use is I've seen cases where the manager and the board and even the residents, they were making roof repairs and there was a paper trail of emails. Uh, there was bids going back and forth. There was people doing work. And then, you know, at year six, they, they decide to file a construction defect claim. Well, the defense is going to argue that you should have known that you had roofing defects and you may not be able to add the roofing defects to the claim. There may be other claims, but it's, it's very important. And that's always, that's just the warning. Be very, very cautious of the four-year statute. And again, you know, if you know these timelines, make sure you're hiring a qualified person, an engineer or a contractor that specializes in this and, and get your community inspected. And I know, Patrick, you probably got something you want to add. So um, <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> I do. Thanks so much, Paul. You, you know, yeah. the thing with uh, the, the changing of the, the statute of limitations and the statute of repose, the, the, the biggest change was with the new statute. And by the way, it takes effect July 1st, 2024, okay? So uh, if if you're out there and you've got a claim and you're saying, oh, I know that it's eight years, so I'm not even going to bother talking to a lawyer, please email me and we'll talk about it. Um, so th this stuff does not become effective until next summer. Um, but it is coming and, you know, it takes a while to to sort of uh, to, to investigate and, and file suit and uh, initiate the 558 process. So, you know, get started now. Do not wait until the spring or else I think you may be out of luck. Um, but one of the, the big things here that's really problematic about the change in the statute is when the statute of limitations and the statute of repose start running. It used to be that it would start running at the end of the of the contract um, or the, the certificate of occupancy, whichever date was later. OK, so it would typically be when the contract was wrapped up and, uh, you know, you you had contracts with the with the contractor and, and maybe a, a contract between the developer and the architect. And, you know, you've got things that are that are continuing to happen throughout the development of that project. So that extends that that start period. Now they've changed the language. They've taken out that contract language altogether. And now what they say is it's the it's it begins with the CO, the certificate of occupancy, or the temporary CO. Okay, so this is the CO that you know a building gets when you know they're just going to start putting in the electrical wiring and some of the plumbing and all of that sort of stuff. So very early on in the process. So not only has the the ten years changed to seven, but it's even restricted more because it starts earlier. Um, so, you know, what I like people to to keep in mind, because a lot of people don't know, when the heck did I get a temporary CA, CO on, you know, this condominium unit? Um, just, just shave off another year, basically. So you're really looking at a six-year statute of repose now. 
for all intents and purposes. So it's um, it's it's a it's a, a bad law. Um, hopefully, the legislature re revisits it. Um, there are also, you know, it's funny. There's a defect in the defect bill. Um, they also removed uh, language as far as renovations are concerned that would start the running of the statute of limitations and the statute of repose for a, for a renovation. And so now it's completely up in the air whether there even is a statute of repose or statute of limitations for a renovation project that doesn't involve a CO or a temporary CO. Um, so it's a bad it's a bad law. Um, it was hastily passed. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping that some revisions happen. In the meantime, reach out to a lawyer. If you have any question about whether or not it's time to file, go ahead and reach out and a lawyer can can help you uh, help walk you through that process. So yeah, technically, there are buildings that are being built that will run out of the statue before they're even completed. That's correct. Before a project is completely finished, you're going to have buildings, you know, so you, you've seen, we've all seen it, you know, these, uh, these large, uh, these large projects, these large townhouse communities, um, where, you know, the last building is finished up, maybe six, seven, eight years after the first building is finished up, you know, especially if there's a lot of phases and areas and whatnot. So you're actually going to have communities that are turning over to the owners where multiple buildings within that community will have already been outside of the statute of limitations and the statute of repose. It's a real problem. Anybody that is a, anybody that is a property manager on this call that is managing a property or at will one time manage a new property, this information is crucial. Anybody that is looking to buy a new condo, whether they're gonna sit on the board or they're gonna be a unit, this is probably one of the most important webinars that you're going to listen to. You have one shot to do the proper investigation and to get the proper representation and to get the proper repairs done, or it is going to cost you a bulk of money. You have one ch chance to hold that contractor accountable. Uh, and if that time runs out, um, you'll be paying for it for yourself. So get some guidance, get some counsel, get the right engineers, get the right contractors out there. But this is one of the most, from a monetary standpoint, this is one of the most important webinars that you're going to listen to because it could mean um, the contractor um, footing the bill or going to litigation. And we'll talk about litigation later or you paying for it for yourself. So I just wanted to emphasize that before we continue. Um, Paul, I know you got to get through all this at some point. So let's uh, let's get back yeah, at it. Perfect, but great point, Rudy. And, you know, these repair projects, especially in South Florida, we're not talking one or two million dollar projects. We're talking five, 10, 15, 20, 20 and up millions and millions of dollars. So if you miss this statute, guess what? An assessment, a loan, uh, the association is going to have to foot the bill. So uh, very important you don't miss these statutes. And Patrick, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen a project where the developer stays on the board so they can't file a construction defect claim. Um, I've seen I've seen that you, you know um, in a HOA and and in a condominium there there is the first step of turnover you know so you you have the election at fifty percent where a non developer owner is elected to the board and they get on there. Um, and then from there, I have seen developers that have slow walked the process uh, to to keep control of the association and let the the statute of, of limitations and repose run. Um, you know, you you only have to turn over at ninety percent, and so uh, it's really easy for a developer to get to eighty nine percent, hold on to some units, maybe they. Um, hold on to a townhouse unit, the last the last one before they reach that 90%, maybe they'll rent it out, you know, instead of actually selling it. Uh, maybe they'll turn that into uh, the model home or something. So there's all sorts of tricks that developers have uh, to keep the statute of repose or, or to keep the community from turning over. Um, now that we have this lowered from 10 years to seven years, we're going to see a lot more developers doing that, I think. So yeah, a couple of quick questions I want to get. Is it seven-year statute for commercial projects as well? doesn't matter, right? doesn't matter, yeah. A commercial, any any sort of construction 
uh, construction project, whether it's commercial or residential. If you find a defect after 558 is completed and settled, what do you do? When does the 558 start after CO? Starts uh, as of July 1st of next year, it's going to start at CO or actually temporary CO. Yep. Um, as far as someone that's already gone through a 558 process, look to your settlement agreement. There's going to be typically anybody you settle with is going to request that there be a release document that's signed um, in order to get your check. So uh, grab that release, send it to your lawyer, have them look at it, and they can advise you on whether or not you have completely released, uh, you know, all future claims or not. Yeah, and and if you have gone through a 558 or construction defect and you get the repairs done and then you still suspect construction building uh, defects or building deficiencies, again, you need to talk to a contractor, an engineer, or attorney because I know Patrick and I have seen many, many second generation lawsuits where we went through this three, four year process. We bid on the job. We don't get it. There's somebody way, 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 way lower. They get awarded the job and they don't do a very good job. And there's still building deficiencies. There's water intrusion. So we start the process all over again. And now this association has been in litigation for six, seven, eight years. So again, you know, one of the themes always with these presentations is just make sure you got the right team, you know, your engineers, your contractors, your attorneys, and make sure you have a good team so you're you're getting uh, good advice and you're hiring the right people. Yeah. Uh, just as a question to you guys, because I know we're talking about buildings that might be built in individual phases. And when is it too late? Because what I'm afraid of is if I was a unit owner where... I'm waiting to see the problem before I report it and have a contractor or a lawyer engineer come out and look at the problem. Should people be having these inspections done preemptively as these buildings are being completed? I say yes. Uh, I, yeah. I, I I say get in touch with the lawyer. If you know a contractor, have them come out. Um, even if you have not turned over, um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at, even the developer appointed board members have a fiduciary duty to the association and to the owners. Um, so it's not just post turnover boards that have this fiduciary duty. So if you see a defect uh, in, in your building and, you know, turnover, maybe turnovers a year away or two years away, but you know the statute of limitations or the statute of repose is approaching, you need to get that documentation and you need to send it to one of those board members, not just the CAM. If you send it to the CAM, those board members are going to later be able to say, oh, I didn't get that. I didn't see that. She didn't pass that on. He didn't pass that on. So find those emails for those uh, for those board members that are appointed by the developer and start sending emails about those defects. Then later, if the statute of, of repose or statute of limitations has run and turnover happens, what you will have, um, despite the fact that you may not have a construction defect lawsuit, you will have a lawsuit for breach of fiduciary duty against the developer and against those developer appointed board members. So think about that. You see a problem, see some, you see something, say something. Yeah, great um, question, Tyler. And matter of fact, I have a whole spreadsheet of projects that haven't turned over yet, but the residents are calling me saying they have building deficiencies and water yeah. intrusion. So we're just documenting and waiting for a turnover until a new board's elected and likely going to file or have an attorney file a 558 claim. Great yeah, question. Because the, the thought process might be, oh, you know, there, it might be leaking now or this might be happening now, but they're not done with the building. They might finish it. Well, who knows if they know that's a problem, right? So that's a good point. Also, yeah. Uh, and also remember, if there is, if, if a claim is filed, the developer has the right to come back and make the proper repairs or give the association money, you know? So a lot of people argue with us or bring up the point of like, well, you're just going to file a claim and then the developer may, may not be all his fault. Well, he has the opportunity to come back and make the repairs. So there's a built-in process for him to do that. You know, ninety percent of the time they don't they don't bother because it's all insurance money, but uh, or the subcontractors' insurance policies. So, um, anyway, great question. 
One of the things that we see come up a lot once a claim is filed, I get many, many calls or emails from managers saying, hey, Paul, um, we need you to come out. There's an elevation of uh, the side of the building has windows and stucco and it's leaking and we want you to come repair it. And um, I know Patrick and I have dealt on many, many times on these issues, but there's a process for doing repairs while you're in litigation. And this is probably one of the number one mistakes that managers make is as soon as they have an issue or water intrusion, they pick up the phone, they call their favorite contractor and they come out and give them a bid uh, to do the work. And there's all kinds of reasons they shouldn't do that. Number one is once the destructive testing is done, the engineers are going to issue a report and then an expert uh, like us is going to give them a cost of repair. So if I'm charging say $20 a linear foot for the mediation bid uh, or square foot, and you got a bid from contractor working out of his garage for $10 a square foot, guess what? You just set a limit on the amount that the recovery can be. And there's arguments around that, but typically what we like to do instead of doing permanent solutions during litigation is we like to do what we call emergency or interim repairs. And essentially, we're going to come out, we're going to call, and we're going to put a last American patching compound and, you know, it, try to stop, minimize. The, the association does have the right to mitigate water intrusion and take care of stuff. But generally speaking, you want to do that with an inner repair or emergency repair. Um, and there are certain instances where you can do a permanent repair. And I'll let Patrick talk about that because we've done that before, but there's a protocol. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's uh, it's called a spoliation letter, um, and and the idea behind it, you know, spoil is is in that word spoliation, and and what you're doing when you make a repair is you're actually changing the evidence. Okay, so think about you know think about a leaking window. You know, so uh, you have someone come out, they remove that leaking window, you replace it with a new window and the old window goes in the dumpster. Um, then you contact your lawyer and you say, hey, uh, I want to make sure that I get recovery for that window I replaced. And then I'm shocked and I say, there was a window replaced? What? Where? Where is it? You know, well, it's in the dumpster. You know, they probably took it away three days ago. You've just spoiled the evidence. The other side, the developer, the contractor, these subcontractors, they have the right to actually inspect that evidence prior to, to it being changed or removed or thrown away. So when you don't give them that opportunity, they then have a defense to the lawsuit. And it's actually a defense called spoliation of evidence. So don't do that. Uh, it's a simple email. You just say, you know, hey, we've got a roof leak out here, Patrick. You know, will you will you do what you need to do? You know, you don't need to remember the word spoliation, but you know, send your letter to the developer and the contractor. I've got I'll have my team put together a quick letter. It'll go out that afternoon, typically, maybe the next day, and it'll have all the information in there. And they'll have an opportunity to come out and inspect. About 75% of the time, 80% of the time, they don't even bother responding to the letter. So they won't respond, they don't send anyone out but you've protected yourself and you've given them the opportunity. And so when I'm in court and somebody says, hey, we didn't have a chance to look at that. I hold up the letter and I say, is that you? Is this your company? Are you this developer? Yes, yes, yes. And you know, here's the certified mail receipt that says that you got this. So it eliminates their defense. Um, and uh, it also it's also a great way to document your damages and what you've done uh, to date. Absolutely. And they also have the ability to come out and witness the temporary repair or whatever repair you're making. That's another very important step. Patrick sends a letter out, says, hey, we're going to perform this repair in 10 days. Um, this is what time we're starting. And again, usually they don't show up, but at least you've protected yourself. Exactly. And for the good developers and the good contractors that are interested, you know, they'll come out and it, it gives them background on the claim and the problem. So they start to say, oh, wait, they are doing work out here. They do have a problem. This isn't just some lawyer sending a letter that says, hey, there's defects. I'm looking at the defects and I'm seeing them. And more on defects. So there's two types of defects. 
um, in a construction defect claim, for the most part, there's only two defects. There's patent defects and there's latent defects. The patent defects are the ones that are readily obvious. You can see delaminated stucco. You can see cracks in your stucco. Um, you can see rusted uh, deck to wall flashing, cracks in your balcony tiles, that sort of thing. But the latent defects, I always um, compare those to like cancer. Those are the ones that you can't see. And those are, the, those are the silent killer because those are the ones that are in your rebar. Those are the ones in your reinforced steel. Those are the ones in the structural steel columns. And that's in your wood framing and your sheeting. And if you, again, if you're not having your buildings inspected and you're not um, thinking about these latent defects, and I think we even have a slide that shows some more latent defects, but there's two main types. And there's a whole, probably another presentation about the statute and the patent defects and the latent defects and the statute of repose and limitation. We're not gonna bore you with all the details now, but um, just remember there's two types and the latent, latent defects are the silent killers. I think we have some more um, examples. So in South Florida, shower pans. I don't think I've been on a high-rise condominium association yet where the shower pans didn't leak. And obviously that's a problem. Um, you have units below you. Uh, the, the, the showers are leaking into the interior walls or leaking into the units before. And also expansion joints, um, you know, where, where two pieces of concrete come together or a contractor has stopped for the day. They're supposed to put control joints or expansion joints or construction joints in there. And many, many, many times uh, they leak. And we've had some major projects where we've had to replace all the expansion joints in the walk decks, uh, even the roads leading up to the community or throughout the building. Uh, some other defects to look out for, debonded stucco, concrete repairs, corroded rebar, Elevated pool decks is a big problem in South Florida. Almost every single one of them leaks. So typically there's a garage structure underneath. Um, so look around, make sure your elevated pool deck's not leaking. Broken PT cables, these are a little harder to diagnose. You can certainly hear them when they break. They're very loud. And that's what gives the uh, concrete its tensile strength. And uh, balcony waterproofing, rotten framing members, roofs, windows and sliding glass doors, and sinking pavers. All right, part of the 558 process, after the claim has been filed, the uh, general counsel attorney or the defect attorney is going to help you assemble a team of experts. And when it comes to destructive testing, usually you're going to hire an engineer, you're going to hire a general contractor, and they're going to go out there and they're going to do sample openings throughout the community. Um, they're going to open up stucco, they're going to water test windows, they're going to water test roofs. It's basically randomized selections of areas um, throughout the entire com community or association. And so what happens is if they're doing these random cuts, generally there's a statistician involved and they randomize the cuts so they can extrapolate later. Again, probably a whole other topic, but it's very intrusive. It's very noisy, um, and ideally, uh, once all these openings are made and the engineer has gotten their evidence and their pictures and all the information they need, the general contractor hopefully puts it back together very similar to what it was. Uh, I know, Patrick, you sent some really bad DT uh, putbacks, but um, it's a very important part of the process, and one of the reasons it's important is because this is how the engineers come up with uh their repair protocol or what's wrong with the building and this is we call those expert reports once the dt is done the engineers are going to issue what they call the expert reports and these are going to go to the construction defect attorney and they're going to read these and they're going to start crafting how they put together this claim what's in the claim what's included in the claim and then eventually uh how much it is to fix those things patrick would you like to add anything you know, um, you, you mentioned the the latent defect, the the hidden defects, um, and yeah. the destructive testing or DT as as we refer to it uncovers those defects. You know, you pull back the top layer of the concrete, and you can look at the rebar inside, 
you pull back the stucco so that you can look at the uh, the wood sheathing and the waterproof barrier that's that's underneath. Um, and you know, it's uh, it's it, it's an important part of this process. It, the other thing, you know, from a law firm perspective, uh, one of the things that you know, in looking for a lawyer, make sure that you look for a law firm that's going to take on the notification process of uh, to the owners. You know, this is obviously, you know, some of these photos, you can see what's going on here. It's loud. There's a lot going on. Um, and uh, a lot of times units need to be inspected as a part of this process. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we do is we tell our CAMs, send me your owner list. We are going to take care of all of this. You know, you, you are busy as it is. So there's no reason for you to be spending your time, you know, coordinating inspections or trying to get in units, we do that for you. Um, the other thing that's uh, that's great about uh, a law firm taking it on is we'll also have our lawyers out there for the testing. We'll have our Becker shirt on, so they've they've gotten the email about the testing. They've got the email about the inspections. They know uh, when it's going to happen. Uh, they know it's from our law firm, and then they see me out there or, or one of the other attorneys out there or or our paralegal. Um, with the Becker shirt on and they can come up, they can ask questions. Uh, we had a situation, uh, this is a hilarious story, but we had a situation where everybody was outside doing the destructive testing. Um, everything was going and the guy comes out of his townhome unit with a machete. And he said, what the heck's going on here? Why are you out here? Somebody's looking in my window. And one of our lawyers was there and said, sir, I'm with Becker. You know, we're, we're here, we're doing some testing, we're doing some inspections. He saw that Becker shirt, he remembered, you know, all the meetings that we had had and all the discussions and all the emails, and he calmed down and he said, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so, you know, look for a law firm that's going to coordinate this process. It is kind of intense uh, from a scheduling standpoint, um, but, uh, but you, you know, doing it right is, is, uh, going to be easier for the case, for the litigation and for the owners as well. Yeah. Make sure if you're ever in a machete fight, you're wearing your Becker shirt and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> titanium, <laughs> titanium Becker shirt. <laughs> so I got a question, um, for Paul and, and, and Patrick. So how long can this last? Because, from the engineering standpoint, somebody asked, how how long will you can you be in a 558? Well, we do the investigation and then we do the destructive testing. And then the association goes back to the contractor and gives them a chance to make it right. What the contractor might do it, and then it might go to litigation and you guys might fight it out in court. And then you hire us to be expert witnesses on the case because we were the ones that were there. How that process could be how long? What's the worst case scenario? I've well, seen him go six, seven years. Yeah, you know, I was going to say be before COVID, um, you know, the courts were not as clogged and um, things things were moving along more quickly. Um, but, you know, it, it, now post-COVID, uh, I, I would say a lawsuit like this, a big lawsuit like this can last three, four years. Um, smaller suit, um, maybe two, two and a half years if it's uh, for a for a smaller amount in controversy. Um, but, you know, the the developers and contractors, they have the ability through the 558 process to to come out, inspect and settle um, without lawsuit being filed. We, we have to wait 120 days before we can file the lawsuit, you know, from the time that we send our 558 claim letter. Um, so they have an opportunity to do it. It's very, very rare uh, that that they actually uh, will yeah. settle before the before those deadlines run. So it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, as they say in the military, hurry up and wait. We have a lot of that in these cases because of the way the statute is set up. Um, but, you know, we try to move our cases along as quickly as possible within the constraints that we're presented. So we're talking about new buildings. Well, what about for a new roof? Can you prove a construction defect or a design defect during the installation of a new roof or a flat roof? So Are do you we talking have to... about a reconstruction or a new building in general? We're talking about a re-roof. Can you, can you <laughs> prove a construction defect on the installation of a new roof? Yeah, an existing building, absolutely. We we are involved in several cases where we were called in, 
you know, say the association is 12 years old and they have a big renovation project done or a new roof put on. So as Patrick alluded to earlier, it's kind of up in the air now with the new law changes, but um, yeah, you have the yeah. opportunity to 558 process can start over. So you your statute of repose and limitations. So we see it quite often. Um, I can name two big projects where that's going on right now. So absolutely. Yeah, I've and I've got three. Um and and they're all re-roofs. And basically the 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 roofs. Uh, there was more water coming into the units after the re-roof than before. <laughs> so that's a pretty good rule of thumb that, you know, they mess things up bad, bad with the, with the re-roof. And, and in yeah, that man. re-roof situation there, it's such a huge cost, millions and millions of dollars on some of these larger communities. And they also don't get legal representation. They don't get an engineer and they only just call the contractors. It is wise whether it's my firm or another firm that you get a roof assessment done. There's a specification written for that roof so we can do the proper um, the proper investigation while it's being installed. And that if there is a failure, you can we can go back and we can share that information with your law firm. So if there's anything that's going to be big ticket items. Uh, it doesn't have to be just new construction. Get your law team involved, get your engineer involved, and have a handful of contractors that you've trusted and you've vetted. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with that completely. You know, one of the things that that happens uh, is I'll, I'll have a cam come to me or a board member and they'll say, Patrick, we've got construction defects. We did this big re-roof project two years ago. It's gone terrible. And, you know, the, everything leaks worse than it did before. And they also destroyed these things and the flashing's not right. And I'll say, send me your contract. You know, I'd love to help you. I'll, I'll, I'll send it over and I'll say, where's the rest of it? This is two pages for, you know, a $2 million re-roof. Oh, that's it. You know, oh, and there's a backside with some fine print. Let me send you that too. The back, let me tell you, that's never good, that, that fine print. Have your lawyer look at a contract that's over, definitely over, you know, 100,000. But, you know, depending on what the, amount of controversy is, you know, have them look at it. You want a good attorney's fees clause. You want a clause in there that keeps liens off of the property. Have a lawyer look at that. Don't step over a dollar to pick up a nickel. Guys, That's quick question yeah, from the insurance perspective. Is this, yeah. is this destructive testing invasive enough where this is something that should be reported to the insurance carrier? I know that we're in hurricane season until December 1st, is this something that we should report to the carrier and say that we're having this testing done? Is this something that could jeopardize the integrity of the building or leave it exposed? Patrick, you want to take that one? I've never had a situation <laughs> where we've made openings and we put them back together and it's got turned into the insurance company. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you know, you've got... You've got three different important folks that are in this destructive testing um, scenario. So you've got the lawyer, you've got the forensic engineer or architect, you know, that's that's helping the association. Um, and then you've got the uh, someone like Paul who is helping with the cuts, you know, opening things up like in this photo right here and then putting it back. The two most important of those three is the contractor, so someone like Paul, and then the, someone like M2E, the, the forensic engineer. Um, you've got those two people working on this issue and making sure that the, the destructive testing goes right, you're going to be fine. And in fact, really what ends up getting put back later is better than what they pulled off, because again, typically you're talking about, you know, you're talking about terrible defects. So it's done in a way where there's not really... A, a that big of a risk it's put back after it's taken okay understood exactly yeah, it's put yeah. back and it's put back better yeah i just wanted to add quickly uh, about management side uh rudy that's a really important question about the re-roofing and tyler you can jump in on this afterward we're seeing from the management side is that a lot of boarders are, are telling us and we're seeing as well that insurance carriers are no longer even bringing a property because of the age of the roof so 
uh, it might have zero lean fully functioning, but just because it's a certain age, they're they're informing uh, informing our boards that they're not going to get an re- upcoming renewal. So this topic, uh, all the board members and CAMs listening, is so big that you want to really take your steps cautiously by reaching out to you know somebody like Beck or your association attorney first before you try to address these, before you even look contract, or before you try to make any type of alteration to your roof, because it's not just new buildings that 558 process, which is turn and it's a common misconception that 558 is for brand new construction, pre-construction only. This is really relevant. We're going to get clarity in the statute, you know, like Patrick was saying for next year, but this is a big, big issue that Tyler is seeing. And so all associations, it's affecting your reserves, it's affecting everything. It's a big ticket item. So for re-roofing, especially if you're their building, consider the 558 process and listen in. You might watch this replay. I think we need a part two for this webinar. There's a lot, there's a lot to go through. Yeah. And honestly, what the crazy part is, is you have a roofer coming out that's giving you 30 to 50 years lifespan on a roof, right? Then I have an insurance carrier telling me that this roof's only going to last 15 to 20 years. The biggest problem that we're facing is a lot of buildings that are older buildings, 1970s, 1960s on the coast, right on the beach. Their only carrier that makes sense from a premium perspective that can cover the entire replacement cost of the building is citizens. Well, guess what? Citizens will not provide insurance if your condominium is in work. So if you're redoing a roof, concrete restoration, et cetera, that work has to be 80% or more done for citizens to be able to write the risk. So right now is a year out from your renewal. This is something to talk about with your agent, right? How how old is our roof and how many more years is the carrier going to give us? Can we have a licensed inspector come out, look at our roofs and give us a piece of paper that says this roof still has life left in it. The roof is fine, right? All these items, the more that you can present the carriers, the more that they can give back. So any of those questions of here's my community, here's an appraisal, here's the last time our roof's updated, what do you think? please send those to me and I can give honest feedback on to what your options are more than likely going to be on the uh, upcoming renewal. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. And just a couple of statistics and, and these, these, I did not source these off the internet. This is just after doing this for many, 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 many years, I would guesstimate that 90% of all HOA townhome communities will go into construction defect or could have gone into construction defect litigation. And in South Florida, high rise, I would guesstimate it's probably 95% of all high rises are going to go into construction defect litigation. So David, this touches everybody, you know, and if you, again, back to the statutes, if you miss it, Association is going to have to foot the bill. So when we talk about these timelines and and uh, and these statute of repose, it's just so important for these people to be cognizant of that and make sure, you know, what's the harm in having a contractor or an engineer come out and do an inspection or talking to an attorney, you know, after turnover or, you know, before the four-year statute of limitations expires. There's no harm in it whatsoever. It can, it's only... It's, it's only positive can come out of it. So again, this this is going to touch almost everybody that lives in a condominium or an HOA. And uh, and one more thing about the roofing, and I, Rudy touched on something very very important about writing, having an engineer write the specification and providing project oversight. Okay, I can probably tell you twenty instances where the association hired a roofer did not have a, uh, uh, an attorney review the contract, did not have an engineer write a spec, and did not have project oversight provided. Now, again, like Patrick said, the roof leaks worse than it did before. So I go out there and I'm like, okay, well, they did a great job replacing the roof. The shingles or the tiles or whatever looks great, except for they forgot to address the, the roof to wall flashing. And that's where 99% of the leaks come from. And so I tell them that, hey, send me the contract. Let me look. And sure enough, there's nothing about roof to wall flashing in the contract. They went with low bid and that's what they got. So David, really important for the cams to make sure you're getting those um, reviewed and you're having a spec written. 
you know, that's just insurance for the association so that you don't now have to go deal with the water intrusion and, and another lawsuit. Okay, what's behind the walls? So when we talk about latent defects, this is a great example. This is actually a project that I worked on. And the picture on the right is a stucco wall that um, the association saw and they're like, hey, you know, I don't think we need to file a construction defect claim. Um, you know, these walls look fine. Maybe we do a little caulking, we paint the buildings, everything's gonna be great. Um, this is what we found when we did a little bit of testing. And ultimately this is from the repair project itself, but you can see what happens behind the stucco. The stucco can look fine. Uh, the concrete can look fine, you know, it applies to reinforced concrete. But if you look at this picture, there was just a little tiny leak up at the very top of the roof where it meets that stucco wall. And we call it a cricket. And in this case, it was a dead cricket and they didn't flash it properly. And water got in there and it worked its way down and by osmosis kind of traveled across the whole entire wall. And what you're seeing at the very bottom, that's an engineered truss supporting that entire wall. And it's sitting on uh, metal side saddles mounted to concrete. And essentially, this, uh, this, this engineered truss was about to give way. And the people, that's, that's their garage door right underneath that. And that's how these people got in and out of their uh, vehicle all day. Ultimately, there was 37 locations exactly like this in the association. They never had a clue. And another good reason to get your buildings inspected, talk to your attorney, talk to M2E, get somebody out there that deals with this stuff, knows where to look, and make sure this doesn't happen to you. Again, some more defects that we see inside of concrete. Um, you know, there's a term we use called spalling, and I know Rody knows all about this, but essentially water gets inside the concrete. It starts working away at the, the reinforced steel inside the concrete. Um, the rust develops around the concrete. Uh, the, the reinforced steel actually increases in diameter and the concrete can no longer hold it. So it, it cracks off, it spalls. And when you see these spalling, you know, just about every con concrete building that has uh, balconies, you'll see a little bit of evidence of spalling. And what's happening is, the water's getting in, inside to the reinforced steel, and it's a big issue. You know, the reinforced steel is what um, gives the structural integrity to these columns and these balconies and these concrete slabs. Let me ask. Let me ask a quick question for Paul and Ruth. Sure. I'm fast with this. Um, there's a there's a bucket. What could be the cause of the problem, right? So you could have something that is. Uh, you know, against code, like building code. And from the management side, we try to remember that's not our expertise. Why we have, you know, uh, an ear consultant, but we have, you know, Jesus with all experience and attorneys necessary. But is we have exterior balconies, right? And you have all, it's a rebuilding building, you know, post-tension cable. Is it code have to be an exterior rated uh, rebar or is it just a bad idea and to, you know, for a developer to try to, you know, have savings and put interior bar on exterior balcony of concrete. I just was curious, what do you guys think about? So uh, you kind of cut out, Rudy, did you get the gist yeah. of that? Mm -hmm. I've seen so that rebar, yeah. sometimes yeah. those post tension cables, they've got to run from one end of the building to the other, and they've got to run through your balconies, right? And that rebar for it to be strong has to be one unit. So that rebar, and you can tie the rebar, but that rebar is going to go through your balcony and into your living room. What needs to happen on that code and what doesn't happen is the top of that balcony needs to be waterproofed. So people are putting tile and they're putting carpet and it's a strong suggestion that they remove that and they put a waterproof membrane every five years to do that, right? Because that water is getting through that porous concrete and it's hitting that rebar. And that rebar, that's the closest point where it's to the surface where it's going to get moisture and when it's going to spall so we have been able we have chased rebar because you have to chip it back to three inches of silver we have chased rebar to the sliding glass door into the living room into the kitchen through the hallway through the other unit right to make sure that all that corrosion is done 
but there's no way that you're going to be able to separate that piece of rebar. And there's one set of rebar for internal. And then on the external Juliet balcony, um, there's a different piece of rebar. Also that post tension cable has got to run through. So uh, it just won't be able to, it won't be able to be done. What needs to happen is that by code, they need to start waterproofing the top of those balconies. And we've gone to hundreds of condos and apartments where it is just porous raw concrete on the top of those balconies and water is seeping in. Yeah, or they put a very substandard waterproofing material on there that lasts like a year. And then the balconies start taking on water and it gets in the rebar. And like Rudy said, we've chased, when you do a rebar repair like this, you have to chip out all around the bad rebar. And when he says chasing uh, silver, what he means is we have to find where good rebar starts again. And we have to take all that out. We have to put new rebar in there. We have to epoxy. There's a whole spec that M2E is going to write what we have to follow. And if we have to chase rebar into the interior of these units because they didn't waterproof the balconies, I mean, these are, you know, millions of dollars types of repairs. So, again, always back to the same thing. Have your team of experts. Make sure you're doing your, your inspections. And a lot of these associations, you have a maintenance team, you know, that's getting called out. Make sure they're documenting stuff. You know, you're keeping up on your maintenance records. But, again, these rebar, it's much easier to replace some rotten sheeting and framing behind some stucco than it is uh, to replace corroded rebar in balconies or post-tension cables or supporting columns. Yep. And I'll tell you this, we have a few associations that were red tagged on their balconies for damage. They can barely even get wind insurance right now. So don't let it get to that point. As soon as you start seeing something, get these guys out there because it needs to be fixed sooner than later. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the statute plays a, a role here too. Um, if the city decides to red tag your balconies because um, of issues that's compromised the structural integrity of the building and you miss the statute, well, now you're forced to do all the repairs out of the association funds or reserves or get a loan. Um, so anyways, the timelines, expert team, inspections, I can't preach it enough. <laughs> Okay, who to call if you suspect building deficiencies? And I know, I think we've covered this pretty well, but a qualified construction company that specializes in this type of work, a uh, qualified engineer like M2E or a qualified attorney like Becker. And of course we have Patrick Cal with us here today. Patrick, I'm gonna do a quick recap of the steps in the 558 process. So number one, if you suspect building deficiencies or construction defects, consult with a professional, construction expert, attorney, or engineer. Um, you give notice to the developer. Uh, he has the right to come back and you make these repairs or give the association money. Uh, file the 558 claim. Um, soon after the claim is filed, usually we move into destructive testing where um, M2E and myself and Becker will be on site. We'll make some openings. Uh, once that's done, a few months later, the engineers are going to come out with the expert reports. And these are going to document everything that's wrong with the community. And they're also going to give you a protocol how they want it fixed. And this is going to be the basis of a lot of times once these reports are written and generated, they send me the report and they're like, okay, Paul, how much does it cost to fix this? And we call that a cost to repair. And we do many of these for the mediation. Um, once the cost of repair is generated and I give it back to the attorneys, it's kind of where the real rubber meets the road. It's where the mediation is going to start. They start going back and forth. And typically, the defense will also get their own expert and he'll come up with a cost of repair. And if it's the developer hiring his own expert, a lot of times they're going to just say, hey, you know what? Put some waterproofing on the balconies, caulk those cracks, paint the building it'll be fine. Um, so those vary very, very widely. And uh, again, it's very important to have the right attorney because he can distinguish and argue on the behalf of the association, what is the real um, repair. And of course, the engineers are gonna be involved. They may have to go in and give depositions on what they found during the destructive testing. Um, and ideally, 
uh, they arrive at a settlement cost and hopefully it's very, very close to what the engineer wanted and then the cost of repair stated and not what the defense rebuttal estimate said. And hopefully there's a settlement agreement. And once there's a settlement agreement, the association will get their funds and then you're going to hire M2E and they're going to come in and they're going to create a scope of work for all the repairs. And then you're going to get competitive bids and then you're going to hire Overton Construction and we're going to be off to a very good start. Patrick, you want to add to that? I know that's in a nutshell. There's so many nuances, but uh, we'll try to broad strokes. Yeah, no, uh, it's a it's a good list. You, you know, you put settlement agreement. Obviously, that's that's the hope is that the parties end up, uh, you know, coming to the table, uh, hiring a good mediator and getting the, the claims between them resolved. Um, sometimes you do have to go to trial. You, you know, I've got a case right now where we've exhausted our, our settlement discussions and, you know, the developer contractor and subcontractors just are are not putting up the money that the association needs to make the repairs that they need. So we're getting ready. November the 6th, uh, we start an arbitration final hearing and, you know, we plan to go go to the mat. Um, we've getting everything lined up. All of our uh, all of our experts are lined up. We're getting uh, all of our witnesses, including unit owners, lined up right now. Um, and the other side has seen a lot of filings and and whatnot. So you know we want to we want to let them know that that we're ready to go to trial if this doesn't if this doesn't settle if they don't you know say uncle in the in the two or three weeks before the final hearing and you need a lawyer that goes to trial. Um, you, you know if if your lawyer if all they've done is settle cases and not try cases they're not going to have the respect from the other side to settle at the amounts that you're going to need to, to make the repairs. Yeah, they have zero leverage and the defense is not going to give them anything if there is no risk of having to go to trial. And trial is, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice, um, but we've seen some huge settlement where the defense could have settled for $5 million and it went to trial and now they got to pay $25 million. So the defense doesn't want to go to trial Nobody really wants to go to trial, especially the defense. And I think too, Patrick, you would agree, you get that trial debt date start uh, set for the trial and everybody becomes much more amendable to trying to get these <laughs> things settled because if it's the last thing they want to see. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah, definitely. It, it it helps. And you gotta hold their feet to the fire. You know, they'll try to move the trial date, they'll try to beg to the judge, you know, hey, we're not ready. Um, so you need a lawyer that, you know, stands firm and says, we're not moving the trial date because that trial date, that deadline is what moves people, um, you, you know, to open their checkbooks and settle. Yeah. You know, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, hey, how do these building deficiencies and these construction defects happen? Like these builders or developers, they build these buildings all the time. Don't they know better? Oh, and by the way, I thought the city was supposed to come out and do these inspections and make sure there wasn't all these building deficiencies and code violations. And um, number one, the, the city inspectors have sovereignty. So what that means is if there's a construction defect claim filed, it doesn't matter if they did the inspections correctly. It doesn't even matter if they pass the inspections through the developer saying them pictures. They have zero liability, they have sovereignty, and I can tell you from personal experience, I've met with some of the really, really big developers and everybody knows their name. And I said, listen, guys, why don't you just hire me? When you complete a big community, just hire me. I'll come out. I'll do an inspection. I'll tell you what's wrong with the community. We'll give you a really good price to fix everything that needs to be fixed so you don't get sued. And you know what they told me? We don't care. We could care less. Uh, we have built-in contingencies. It's all insurance money. And at the end of the day, um, they're being counters and they're worried about their bottom line. So there's there's some chinks in the armor in terms of this process. And that's another reason that none of us that specialize in this niche are really happy about the statute moving from seven, or from 10 years to seven because it prohibits a lot of these associations and holding these people responsible for the ones that actually created these defects 
and these issues for these associations. So, Paul, I will say, and just to be uh, fair, we, we've represented both sides. We've represented developers on the 558 because they need representation, and we've represented associations. There is a small amount of developers that will hire engineering firms to do QA as a process is being built. If, the, if we see something wrong, we say something, we document it all while they're being built. So that when, if it does go to litigation, that we're able to prove that it was done right. So there are some developers that will take the extra steps. Um, and those are the buildings that I would, um, that I would live in. Um, there Ruby, are some developers. That, that, that QA is quality assurance is part yep. of the, the process. Yeah, we do the quality insurance, make sure that the developer that hired the general contractor, that these, they're doing it right per the design. We're not the designer of the building. Um, and we're able to document all of that so that the, of course, it's 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 for um, you know litigation purposes, but it's also a great thing to have that the association can always hold that says the 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 construction of this building has been documented and they have that on file forever as a as kind of a bible, if you will. Um, a lot of other developers aren't providing that, so uh, questions to ask. Um, Patrick, I have a quick question from your perspective, and I already have my opinion, but I want to hear from the expert attorney. We see many birds that are very successful in their own right. That's why they got elected. They're at a luxury high rise. They've been hugely successful in their own businesses, and they, rightfully so, they have some a real base and and uh, proof in their own life for their own thought process to be often the right thought process. But sometimes that kind of gets them into dangerous waters where they outthink the process. They think they can go a little bit smarter than what a man company recommends. And they want to go with the standard of litigation. They don't want to go the standard of even uh, mediation or, or seeking settlement. And they kind of want to maybe uh, with their own negotiation on the side or cement process on the side. What's your view on that? What's the success rate on that? And should is it better to just simply go formal, go strict, go aggressive? What, what's your? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so, sometimes you will have uh, you know one one or two board members uh, that um, you know maybe they were a. a a civil contract, a, a civil engineer in Michigan, they moved to Florida, you know, to retire. And, and, you know, so they've got some ideas about what the problem is and, and all of that. Um, you know, what, what I try to encourage them all to do uh, are, are the worst ones are the former lawyers, you know, the retired lawyers that are on the board that have moved from New York and, you know, well, this is not the way we did it in New York. And, you know, trust the folks that you hire. You know, that's why you've hired them. Um, they are the the experts. And that's how you fulfill your fiduciary duty is mm -hmm. by, by bringing in experts, um, listening to them and, and following their advice. When you sort of go off the reservation, as they say, and you start, you know, maybe direct messaging the developer, um, you, you know, you're doing a couple of things. Number one, you're violating the attorney-client privilege. You're passing on information to, to the developer that should be between the board and, and your lawyer. Um, you're also vi violating the duty of trust. So, you know, you 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 go and 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 maybe hire a separate, you know, engineer or talk to a buddy that's an engineer and you say, you know, this is what, they don't have all of the facts. You know, they don't have all of the information. They haven't inspected, you know, so they come back to, you know, I, my friend who's an engineer said that this, we're doing this all wrong. You know, well, they haven't inspected. They haven't looked. You probably haven't provided them with the full information. They probably haven't even looked at the building plans. Um, so, you know, trust the process. I, I, I know that, um, you, you know, it's difficult. You want the things to get fixed immediately. You want to fix the problem. Um, but but trust the process and, and trust those experts that you've hired, whether it's MTUE Overton Construction or, or Becker. The other thing we see is the opposite. We'll see folks that, and, and this, is, this is based on psychology, people do not want to think that there's a problem with their home. And so, you know, they're, you know, they're faced with all of this information that Cam has come and said, you know, we've got issues here, we got problems. 
the maintenance guy. Look at these photos that that he's taken. We need to have a board meeting on this. We need to bring in a, a lawyer. We need to, you know, and they're like, no, 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 no. You know, that's that's bad too. You know, no one, you know, sticking your your head in the sand like an ostrich does not make the problem go away. And, you know, later on when there are issues and we talked about the statute of limitations, that thing runs. And then the pot of money that you could have gotten from the developer, the contractor and the subcontractors and their insurance companies. Now that pot of money comes from the owners that you represent as a board member. So uh, I've seen it before <laughs> and uh, please uh, take it as a cautionary tale. Listen to your experts. A few housekeeping items. Peggy's going to send out one email with everyone's contact information. She's also going to send the link to the uh, YouTube link that has this um, presentation on it. At some point, you'll probably receive individual communications from us because we like to keep everybody up to speed on how amazing we are. Um, if anybody has any questions, please reach out to anybody on this panel. We are here to help. We're all about education. We're all about community. That's why we assembled uh, this team. So um, with that, if nobody has anything else, I'd like to turn it back over to Peggy. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, I just want to close by saying thank you to Paul putting the presentation together into the, the panel, excellent panel. Lots of information today. So that's why we are sending out the... Uh, the video on this. And uh, I just want to interject that, you know, again, consider Ventium for a website uh, so that you guys can be transparent uh, with anything that's going on in your community. And uh, we hope you all enjoyed the class today. And uh, we are going to be having more that are going to be hosted by M2E Engineering, uh, bringing more pertinent seminars, uh, providing uh, information for your project. So thanks everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank